Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Bill. That was a, a fabulous introduction to the topic. Um, my title is a lot different than what it looks like in the handbook. Um, I submitted that thinking it was more technical, and this is a more general version of this talk. So let me give you just a, a sense of, of maybe why I'm here. I'm not an ecologist. Um, my original training is in applied math and meteorology. In fact, I was actually a forecaster um, in meteorology uh, in the private sector. Um, and actually, the thing that, that got me interested in, in going back to the PhD in statistics was, well, were two main things. One is I was frustrated by the fact that we could take information from the Weather Service, and this was back in the 1980s, and, and then have to kind of take this in. And I was involved in doing radio forecasting for um, farm producers in, in the Central Plains. And then we take this and we sort of massage it and give this to them in, in, in some way. And, and what was frustrating about that was, was the way that we were taking this detailed information uh, from these numerical models and then trying to convey it without any really good sense of what the uncertainty was and what we were trying to say. And, and so the other thing that I got an appreciation for out of that was, was dynamics and, and the importance of process-based uh, modeling. So fast forward a bit, so I did research on this and then was fortunate enough to be involved in sort of the revolution of, of Bayesian computer, uh, computation in terms of Markov chain Monte Carlo and, and hierarchical base models and, and involved in the incorporation of that in the environmental statistics. And then I had done some of this work and then Jim Clark's paper came out in 2001 and I had a paper in the uh, Journal of American Statistical Association about the same time doing this from a uh, meteorological oceanographic perspective. And Jim said, can you write a paper for, for the special issue of ecology? And I said, sure, because you know, I'm an assistant professor and don't know anything. And literally did not think about ecology. And so I immediately started reading books and stuff. And, and I realized that the, the, the interesting connection to me was the dynamics. And that, so, so I got involved in, in doing some work on invasive species, and I'm most lucky to work with some students and colleagues along the way. So what I want to do today is pretty much give you um, uh, an overview. I'm just I'm looking to see which version of this talk. Okay, but this, <laughs> this isn't the version that I thought it was, but that's okay. Let me do that. Uh, uh, so, uh, so. What I want to do today is want to, this is the kind of um, process that, that we've been talking about all, all along so far in this, in this workshop. So it is complexity across multiple scales of space and time. So this is an example where, for example, an El Nino can affect the amount of precipitation over North America, which could affect habitat, which could affect uh, where mountain that's might uh, want to be for, in terms of sowing petals for breeding purposes. And then you've got all these sort of potential predation issues that could go on simultaneously with that. And so, so there's uncertainty across the, the spectrum here. There's uncertainty in the data, there's uncertainty in the process dynamics and, and, and the parameters that go with that. And so, um, in this overview talk, I kind of want to uh, dive a little bit this slide, but um, I, I, I want to talk about hierarchical models. And just as bad, I know that's kind of the, the state of the art now. Um, in this world in ecological forecasting, and, and rightly so. Uh, but I want to talk about some of the things about that that I think are important historically and, and for the future, and then talk a little bit more about some, some specific types of process models where we're incorporating information from various types of knowledge into a, a formal interpretive computation framework. So I won't focus on any details. Um, so uh, to begin with, uh, the, the fundamental part of a, of a hierarchical model is really the data model. And so this is this notion of our observation model. And, and why is it so important? And, and so the, the revolution that the stage-based modelers came up with in control engineering in, in the late 1960s and that hierarchical modelers picked up on was this notion of separating out the complexity of your data from the underlying stuff that you care about. And so it's this notion of conditioning. The notion of conditioning in modeling is absolutely fundamental, both in terms of, of the deep learning kinds of things that people are doing, but also what we do in kind of deep hierarchical modeling and, and statistics and, and science. And, and that is because all the dependence, all the interesting things across scales, across processes, across aspects of our system are in the process. 
the data itself has complexity, but when you condition out the complexity of the process, it allows you to focus on the issues with the data, and that might be sampling here, or measurement data, or, or missing data. Um, it's very difficult to deal with missing data if you've also got to try to deal with the complexity of what's going on in the dependent structure at the same time. And then you know, the other beautiful thing I think about this framework is that it allows you to, to consider multiple data sources very equally. And so this is the notion of data assimilation. Um, and, and when you do it in a statistical way and accounting for all the probabilistic aspects, then it's easy once you condition multiple data sets on a common process to work out what those relationships might be. Easy in principle, not necessarily. <laughs> And so, so the examples over on the right hand side here are some stuff that um, uh, my student uh, Warren Schaefer is here in the audience somewhere, um, and I and some colleagues are doing um, related to understanding behavior um, and uh, life from the east and, and all of all across the, the migratory pathway. And where you have, you have satellite data corresponding to habitat, you might also have accelerometer data on, on each individual. That GPS measurement. So very high frequency data, very large volumes of data. And yet you're dealing with individuals. You know, we may have 10 individuals that we're dealing with here and, and trying to, to infer behavior and predict behavior based on that. And this is this is what allows us to do it. The process part of these models are also um, this is sort of where I spend most of my work because this is what interests me the most in terms of understanding the, um, the relationship between space and time. And, and process um, individual dynamical systems. And here the, 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 the key issues are interaction across time and space of different scales. And I think we've, we've seen this come up in this workshop so many times already, and I think it's the fundamental problem we face in dealing with, with big scientific forecasting problems, is how we, how we accommodate um, this. And in, in the meteorological notion of graphic world, it's a lot more well defined. We have cascades of energy, and we understand to some extent how those work, and we can build models that do that. And while we might have trophic cascades, for example, in ecology, it's not near as clear, it's not near as well defined how things transfer from one scale to the next. And then when you combine things across platforms, even in the meteorological and oceanographic community, the biggest challenges are where the processes interact. That's the stuff we don't understand. And this is what we don't understand in, in ecology either. Uh, and, and in fact, it's sort of the holy grail in many respects. So, so the beauty of this framework is, is that you can start doing this. You can start at least trying um, to, to build interactions across the environment and across, and across the, the processes. Um, and then the last part of this framework that I think is crucial is, is and, and actually fundamental to this, and what separates what, what we started doing in, in the mid-1990s from what the control engineers had done for, for decades before that, was start modeling the, pro the parameters of these systems as processes themselves. And, and by doing that, why is that important? Because there's the dependence that, that we can't deal with. We can't model everything, the complexity, in just the process and the data we have to start building that complexity up through marginalization. And what does that mean? It means if, if parameters share commonality, and we sort of integrate that out somehow, it builds dependent back. And so by, by, by doing this in this sort of deep structure, one parameter level, another parameter level, um, we, we can build dependence up. And this is exactly what goes on when you hear about deep modeling in the machine learning world. They don't, they don't say that they're microwising that, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're finding small features, they're integrating them up across multiple scales. So, so this notion of deep modeling is exactly what we, what we do, and that's what comes from the parameter aspects of our complex hierarchical models. And then at the end of the day, this is pretty much a Bayesian paradigm because um, you, you could, in principle, start putting some empirical kind of information in the parameter state, but basically, to do your inference on the parameters, and, the, and, and particularly in the forecasting case, on the process, you have got to start thinking about the product of each one of those distributions, the data distribution, the, the process, and the parameter distribution. And that posterior distribution is what, what gives you your inference and your predictions. Now, of course, as, uh, as Leah mentioned, that's a, that's a super big challenge, and, and so computationally. And so what we have to do is we have to modify our models and our, and our data structures and our infrastructure, our cyber infrastructure, to be able to solve those problems. So this is just a general 
laid out of, of what I would call the, uh, what, what I did call the sort of Bayesian state space model. I mean, I would call this uh, a, a paradigm for, for sort of more space time based um, thinking. But I don't need to go over all these stages. I just, I just want to point out the middle stage right now, which is this uh, process model, which is almost always in the frameworks that we've seen in, in your literature and in the literature that I work in, um, a Markovian type model. In other words, conditioned on all the paths of the process. We only care about the most recent paths in terms of evolution. I'll come back to that a little bit later here in the end of this talk. The one thing I didn't write on this slide, um, on the modified version that's there, um, is, is because of yesterday, I wanted to emphasize the point about initial conditions and boundary conditions. And the beauty of this framework is it allows you to put distributions on those as well. And I think that's absolutely crucial. So, so just a, a little hodgepodge of different models that you might be interested um, in seeing in this kind of framework. Um, okay, so there's a blog there that would Sort of propagate up to the right and diffuse with the two. Um, so, so what about like a linear model? A linear model is just going to reorient what happened in the past into the future in a linear dynamical model. And so these weights, these M's here, kind of control the dynamics. And then the nice thing about this, even in this simple type of model, this is about as simple a dynamical model as you can get. And these high dimensional processes that we're dealing with, these high dimensional data sets, the number of parameters here is, is problematic, and you have to start parameterizing this. In other words, what I mean, it means we have to put structure on these M's, these transition coefficients. Some of them we don't need, some of them we shrink to zero. Some of them the science can tell us what we need to do. For example, we know that, that, this, that if, if these things are asymmetric, then it's going to lead to propagation. And we know that the rate of decay across um, a region depends, uh, defines their fusion. So we can actually parameterize statistical models based on this knowledge. Same thing can happen in, in a nonlinear context. And so this is a, just a simple uh, reaction diffusion model that has density dependent growth. And again, this nonlinear model implies a, a type of nonlinear um, uh, stochastic model as well. And, and, and the problems with these sorts of models is that if you let them, there's so many parameters to deal with that you can't possibly estimate them. But if you use process knowledge, um, scientific-based knowledge, to help sort of shrink some of the parameters to zero, as well as some statistical uh, regularization tools, you can actually fit these models, the quadratic and nonlinear models, in, in this larger <coughs> hierarchical framework. And again, I don't know if, so none of my videos are working at this point. Um, so again, there's a spread, I just imagine that these color goes is spreading out through the U.S. to uh, forecast. Okay, so, so the challenge with that is that those models all have a lot of complexity associated with them. Um, this is probably some of my videos are actually working and some of them aren't. So that, there must be an indication of which ones are important. <laughs> so, so coming back to this one then, um, or not. Um, Um, so, so one of the things that we've been thinking about recently um, is trying to to, um, to build these kind of process models when we don't have so many parameters. What can we do? You know, how can we use science and how can we use machine learning um, uh, techniques to, to build these same kind of structures, but without worrying about so many parameters? That's one way to deal with this issue. And so one of the things you could do is like you could build a database model. So you go back down to the to the small Level. The number of rules it takes to model complex things are typically pretty, pretty small. In a, if you can allow some of the parameters to vary across time and vary across space, and so collective movement models are a perfect example. These are the simplest models I know of. Uh, uh, they're very complex nonlinear systems, but in terms of the number of parameters that control them, it's actually on the order of, of less than ten typically in, in realistic type systems. So this is, this is an example as you can deal with the complexity of denominatarity um, in a low dimensional parameter space, it really frees things up to do your estimation. And that's the same thing true with, with different kind of agent based models. <laughs> One that, uh, another framework here that I wanted to mention that we've been playing with in the last few years is, is 
this notion of what we would call analog models, but in their literature, I think they're often called mechanism free models. And this idea came back, analog forecasting was actually originally in meteorology, back before there were numerical models, and there were only some weather maps, mainly in Northern Europe, that's where the meteorology started. And, and they had historical maybe 30 years with the weather maps that weren't very good at the surface because there were no upper air observations. And so when they were doing forecasting, for example, for, for the D-Day invasion, what would they do? And so the idea was, I would find a sequence of maps in the past that looked like my most recent sequence of, of weather events. And I would say, well, what happened, what's going to happen now is what happened in the past when I messed up to that sequence of events. And it actually sort of works, um, <coughs> even if that naively, um, but it immediately was surpassed by numerical weather prediction in the 1950s when that, when that came online. It came back, though. People like Ed Lorenz and, and others started looking at this in the context of dynamical systems and realized that what we really have here is, is, is the notion, the same notion that Hawkins talks about and Susan Hardman talks about in their literature in, in this um, mechanism free world of embedding vectors. And so if I embed, what is an embedding vector? If I take a uh, enough uh, lags of one dimension of, of a complex um, uh, dynamical system, I can recover the, the higher dimensional states um, uh, in, in terms of its evolution. And so if you imagine looking, for example, at these three locations on this tractor, uh, all of which are represented by lags of embeddings of, one, of this one variable, um, if I can tell that one of the green ones was close to the blue one, then maybe the evolution of the green one, if I knew how the blue one had evolved in the past, then the green one would be pretty similar. And, and this idea works pretty well. And the, the question is, can you really build this now in, in a framework that accommodates uncertainty and, and, and large-scale prediction problems, as opposed to just time series? And so this is something that, that we were interested in. Can we actually take these things, like these sequences, of not just points, but now maps that are actually evolving in time. And here's an example where you have sea surface temperature maps, and this is a library of them, and then this is soil moisture over Iowa. So if we were trying to predict soil moisture over Iowa, could we find the most, this is the current, say, sea surface temperature conditions in the, in the past, or in the most recent past, can we find the kind of collection of those um, past evolutions of, of these sea surface temperature maps and if so, our forecast is simply a, a weighted average of, of what this ensemble of, of um, analogs would have been in the past. And, and so, yeah, you can do that. But the, the question, if you actually start doing this in an uncertainty quantification framework, it's not trivial because it's easy to do, it's easy to generate these forecasts. It's not so easy to do it in a framework that accommodates uncertainty. And so, the things that you don't know is that what's the distance? How do you measure the distance between a sequence of maps and another sequence? And, and we, there's not a unique way to do that. What's the appropriate way? How do you do the weights? What's the best way to weight these things? Which is an interesting um, they could talk yesterday related to that. Uh, embedding variables. You're embedding variables. The thing that you build your maps don't have to be the thing that you're actually predicting. And so, what what are the embedding variables? And it's, it's a very very complex dynamic, dynamical system. So you get to choose which parts of it that you want to take the embeddings from. How do you pick the dimensionality? Can you do this for non Gaussian data? And then, more, most importantly, can you do it uh, accommodate uncertainty quantification? So, an example that, that we use, one of the examples we use, is to do um, take breeding population survey data. And, and so, basically, why this is important is because if you know the, um, the, both the productivity on the landscape, then it actually suggests if I'm a Part of the conservation in Missouri, where I live, and they're, they're um, issuing hunting uh, licenses for the next year, um, it's going to help them to know what the breeding population was in, uh, in Canada or in Alaska in terms of, say, mountain ducks. And, and there's a lot of variability of that year to year. Um, there's some linearity, and if you actually do a, um, some analysis, and you can find that there's a, a, a decent linear association between counts year to year. But a linear prediction, prediction is not going to be that good. It's not going to be terrible. But clearly, there are features that are not linear in this kind of prediction. And so the goal here would be to do a one year and a half forecast of, of the production on the landscape um, based solely on sea surface temperature in this case. 
So I have a bunch of slides about the, the model that I'm going to kind of skip over because I built this not long ago and I, I redid it last night thinking it wouldn't be this technical. Um, the only thing I want to say about it, um, yeah, see, this is just, it gets crazy, um, <laughs> is that it really isn't, a, it's not really a crazy model. Uh, the thing about that model that, that all it really is is a weighted regression model. The, the thing that makes it interesting is that the weights, when you're weighting the, the potential past values of the um, uh, selling patterns, is that those weights are based on the analog, on, on the analog matching of the, of the sea surface temperature. The coolest thing about it is there's five parameters in that model. So, so now we've taken this very, very, very high dimensional complex system and, and built it into an uncertainty quantification framework, but there's only five parameters to estimate. And so that, that's sort of what the goal was to get there. And it actually works pretty well. Um, it definitely works better than the, any kind of linear predictor, any predictor that has existed up to that to now. Um, so we were pretty encouraged by that, and again, all I'm showing you here is, is just the, the, the cutoff intervals from the Bayesian predictions, the posterior mean, and the, and the observations, all out of sample. So the last thing I wanted to say here before, before talking just a, a little bit, I don't know the time yet, but I think I probably don't have the time. Um, is like, what, what would be a parsimonious way to do this from the deep learning perspective? And, and I've been working in this space for a bit now, and, and so, first of all, you probably pick a recurrent neural network because it's going to be based on sequence data. That's what it's designed to do. Um, it, it, this is why it works so well for language processing. Um, <laughs> the problem with that is if I, if I took a, a standard, this is just a basic vanilla argument. and nobody would actually use this. You would use a complicated version of these models. But it does illustrate the point, and that is this is my output response, say it's a spatial field. And then this hidden layer, notice that there's this um, activation function here, but the, the interesting dynamics happen because of this recurrence where these agents keep getting recur uh, uh, I guess impacted one after the other, and then inputs come in at each level. So the parameters correspond to these matrices U, W, and E up here. And so the, a couple things to note. One, it, it's highly nonlinear. It's recursive in the sense that the memory, the, it remembers the H's from way back in the past. This is why it works really well for language processing. And if, it, it, if, you're, if you're trying to predict the next word in a sentence, to know what happened four or five words ago might be pretty important. The other thing to notice is there's no uncertainty in this model whatsoever. There's no air terms, there's no random parameters, there's nothing. So, um, again, these aren't the, the kinds of models that are used to actually implement this now are, are gated networks um, because it, it helps break some of the dependence from the image impact propagation. But there was another approach to that problem that was done um, in the late um, 2000s that's now sort of out of favor and it's called an echo state network. Echo state networks look very much the same, the difference being that all the parameters here, the W's and the U's in the, in the process model in this reservoir, are random. They're chosen once at random, and, and what happens is that you've expanded the space space, so the H is very high dimensional, and so you learn then there's just a regression at the end or some sort of a, a simple stat model at the upper level where you put a lot of regularization to get rid of most of those H's or shrink them down to zero. Why is this, well, it was like, taking a while to, to go into it, but, but it does work surprisingly to have random parameters here because what you're really doing is you're building basis functions, um, uh, transforming your input structure using this dynamics and then you get a lot of choices and you can, you can make this work. So we tried to say, well, what would happen if we took that and put it again? And let's put that in a, in, a, in a Bayesian hierarchical framework so we can actually accommodate uncertainty. And, and, and then um, Torn actually, um, who's here, has extended this into a a, a forecasting environment with, with count data. And then we have quadratic terms and, and embedded input vectors. But the other thing is it's, it's ensemble based. So we get uncertainty quantification. One, we get a, a whole system of weak learners that we can, we can borrow strength from, but the other is that we have uncertainty quantification from that. And so this is hot off the presses, but, but uh, the work has shown so far, and this is just naive, pretty naive model, but this model is already doing better than the Bayesian analog model. Um, and again, th 
this model is only really a Poisson regression at the end of the day uh, with a high dimensional transformation of the, of the input structure. So, um, uh, if you want the detail, I'm going to talk about this at a poster today later, so you can, you can check those out. But just so, uh, to finish this up, um, there, there's certainly a lot of data complexity in, in everything we do, and that's not going to go away. And, and so that's going to lead us to have to model. We're still interested in modeling complex processes, but we have to start thinking about ways to do that that can also accommodate the data complexity, but, but real, really realizing that the computational um, issues here are, are pretty tremendous as well. And so I think these, these sort of Bayesian models in principle work, but their challenge, the challenges are they're over-parameterized. We have new data sources all the time coming online, which we've heard people talk about, very high volume things. And that's only going to increase the computational challenges involved in this, and also lead to new types of models. And um, some other things that I think are, are super important here that I didn't talk about is, is model selection in these environments, and more importantly, model validation. Um, you know, sort of behind the times. Um, I want to make a point about that is um, in, in the meteorology literature. Uh, there, there's some great work, um, Alan Murphy, the late Alan Murphy did a lot of this work back in the 80s and 90s. And there's a paper, a famous paper of, of Murphy's in 1993 where he talks about, I think there are nine different ways to, to think about um, validation of these kinds of models from different perspectives. And it kind of reminds me of the fact that if they say that the Inuits have 40 to 50 words for snow. So if you were spending all your life working on trying to understand how good models are for forecasting and prediction, then maybe you should look at more than just mean squared error or mean absolute error. You know, maybe, maybe we start we have to start looking a lot deeper into it. And people have. And, and um, if you look into that um, validation literature in, in that community, um, it's actually quite amazing. And almost none of that is propagated in statistics. Perhaps it's propagated in methodology. Um, the other thing that's come up, and I, I believe very strongly in, is communication to visualization. And visualizing uncertainty in high dimensions is, is really, really challenging. And that's something that we're working on, and, and, and many others are. And I think um, it's actually really good to see this happening right now. And this is what we need to convey this information. Uh, some exciting directions, computation, variational methods are, 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 are becoming practical for these kinds of complex problems. Ensemble met, uh, methods, ensemble common filters, we saw that earlier today. To do that in an environment that also can accommodate parameter uncertainty and complex things. Um, it's not quite there yet, but we're working on it. Um, various kinds of hybrid approaches. Mixed data, where your data and your processes are at different time scales, um, which happens all the time now. What's the best way to do that? How do you want to aggregate this stuff? Um, in, in that context, in terms of aggregation, uh, we're, we're working on ways to come up with optimal ways to, to deal with data redundancy. And so, for example, we have um, examples where we have satellite data uh, on, and for prediction purposes where you might have um, 10,000 observations and that you can show that you can really um, reorient this stuff in, in terms of aggregation if you're, if you're um, careful about it in a, in a systematic way so that maybe only 300 locations are necessary and you get exactly the same inference way. And you actually design this so that's what happens. And so, so that's a cool area. Uh, deep models, I think incorporating mechanistic information into deep models is going to be uh, is here for the future, uh, or it is something to work on in the future. And in that context, using these kind of important science based models in, in the context of reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning, it is going to be really exciting. And we can already do that, but to do it with, with these kinds of models that actually build and process information isn't really being done as much as I think it could be. And then the same thing with the sort of um, episode on network technology. So at the end of the day, that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions or any, anything I refer to, I'm happy to talk to it. I'm going to make a plug for this new book because it's free. Um, so basically, everything I just talked about is in this uh, book. 